Hey, Redwood A-Push, it is Mr. Vieira. I'm Mr. Eskridge. And we are back for another lecture series. This chapter is on life in industrial America, chapter 18. We hope that you guys are enjoying American Yacht. We hope that you are making the most of the opportunity that we have um, to learn digitally. We know that it's not a perfect world, and I know speaking for myself and Mr. Eskridge, we wish we had you guys in our classrooms, but we're making the most of this thing um, and keeping each other safe while staying apart. So, Mr. Eskridge is going to begin our lecture on life in industrial America by covering the railroad. So, whenever you are ready, Mr. Eskridge, take it away, sir. All right, let's hit it. Okay, so um, as you remember from the reading, um, a couple of chapters ago when we read about the Civil War, um, with the Civil War, re Republicans were in control of Congress and control of the presidency. And as such, many of them were Northerners and railroads, as we remember, were really prominent in the North, not so much in the South. And so during that Civil War period, and then after railroad construction, the lane of tracks just exploded. And as we talked about um, previously, or last week, when we looked at chapter 16, um, railroads, railroads, excuse me, were in, um, integral integral to the development of industry, to the economy of the United States as um, manufactured goods, farm products were um, transported on railroads. They just grew with importance as the economy of the United States grew. So after the Civil War, um, about 240,000 square miles were given to railroad companies, um, about larger than the state of Texas, um, were given to railroad companies to develop track. And so most of the track was laid west of the Mississippi River. And we'll show you a map in just a second that'll show um, railroad development prior to um, and after the Civil War. And we'll see the majority of it is west of the Mississippi. So in 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad um, met near Ogden, Utah um, at Promontory Point, um, which again, we'll show a picture of that in just a second. Um, the railroads were mostly built by the Irish and Chinese immigrants. And so the Irish worked basically from the east um, moving west and the Chinese um, worked from the west moving east. Both of them had very difficult situations. Probably the Chinese probably had um, the shorter end of the stick as they had to cut through the Sierra Nevada mountains and go through um, the majority of kind of the desert um, regions where the, the, the railroads going from the east to the west were laid through the plains, which is you know, flat and um, arid at times, but um, the Chinese definitely um, probably got the short end of the stick and you know, yeah, whatever. Um, so railroads often sold excess land to developers and made huge profits. So um, it wasn't that Congress just gave the land to the railroad companies and they laid the you know narrow tracks, as you see, you have seen railroad tracks, they don't take up that much space um, on their own, but it was basically the land um, out from the railroad tracks was also given to railroad companies who then sold that to speculators kind of on like a, a patch, a grid system. And so railroad companies are not only making money off of transportation on the railroads, of people, of goods, but also by the selling of um, land to homesteaders, to developers as well. So um, as I talked about in the reading this week or for 18 and last week, railroad companies really were the first industries within the United States to amass such wealth um, that was never seen of before. Um, the Interstate Commerce Act was put into place or put into play by Congress in 1887, which basically tried to um, create more um, fairness, if you will, within the railroad industry um, as far as like setting prices and stuff. And we talked about that last week with the populist movement where farmers were really struggling because they could not have a big say in negotiating prices of their products as they were shipped. Okay. Um, so here is an image of Promontory Point where the, the uh, Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads met um, in on May 10th, 1869, and kind of funny, by 1903, um, a cutoff had basically made this track, this meeting, um, that this famous picture, um, obsolete. So, kind of sunk into um, non-existence, which I think is hilarious. But whatever. Okay, uh, moving on to our next image. So the map. So here we can see what we were just talking about. So the green is major rail lines um, in 1870. So yes, that is after the Civil War. Um, but then the red is major rail lines added um, between um, 1870 and 1890. So we can just see that exponential growth of railroads, um, especially around the Mississippi um, region and west. Okay, so 
from sea to shining sea, from the left coast to the right coast, and we can travel by train across the great country. Okay, uh, Mr. Vieira is gonna take over technological innovation. All right, thank you, Mr. Eskridge. So the, by 1900, by the turn of the century, the United States has become the largest industrial nation on earth. It has surpassed England, it has surpassed Germany, um, and it is the top dog in terms of industrial output. Now, there's four reasons, and we listed them for you there, why the United States is the largest industrial nation on earth. First, liquid capital. There's a lot of cash in the United States, and the banking system within the United States allows for easy investing. Uh, as Mr. Eskridge said, the railroad company becomes incredibly successful, but other businesses as well start to spring up, and they have the ability to raise money to start their business and run their business because the American uh, financial system um, is, is relatively stable compared to other countries and is really allowing for business to um, thrive. Second reason is the United States is big. It's a big, large nation, and within its borders, it has a tremendous amount of natural resources. Um, oil, uh, coal, the types of things that you need for an industrial nation. And so because of that, Americans are able to exploit those resources uh, to help grow the nation. The workforce. Uh, the United States of America was a nation in which it had relatively, um, it had a, a large growing immigrant population and that provides a cheap labor source in factories, uh, as Mr. Eskridge said, with, especially with the Irish and Chinese laborers on the railroad. And that labor source is able to keep the cost of production down. And the fourth reason is just good old fashioned American ingenuity. Um, the American legal system sets up patents, which means if you create something and you patent it, you own the rights to it. And so that really like uh, provides incentive for Americans to be tinkers uh, and to, create or try to create the next new thing that will helpfully uh, make them the individual wealthy, but then also uh, help society at large. Uh, two such gentlemen, Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison, um, lead kind of this revolution in, uh, in technology. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone, which I know as teenagers, you're all very thankful for that. Uh, one of the realities of the telephone is it actually increases job opportunities for women. The sexism of the time that you know was rampant in the workplace and we will see for the next 100 plus years in America, uh, telephone and being a telephone operator or secretarial work, um, well, that was viewed as a job beneath a man in the 19th century, 20th century. And so those jobs were created uh, and overwhelmingly women were hired in those roles. Now, saying that it is beneath a man, that's obviously was part of the sexist view of the time, but one of the realities is as women enter the workforce, uh, there's a, a sense of financial independence that follows with that. Uh, and so that's important in terms of, of creating social change. And then in 1879, Thomas Edison invents a light bulb and America will quickly transition to um, having its electric grid spread throughout cities and then ultimately uh, as we move into the mid 1900s into rural areas. This changes the way people live, this changes the way people work, um, and uh, modern America is really born in the early 1900s as a result of these various inventions. Uh, a couple that we have here on the next slide, you see the light bulb, uh, that thing on the top is a telephone, trust me, I know it looks nothing like what we have today, and then on the bottom, um, a typewriter. The image on the right is the Flatiron Building in, in New York City that is one of the first skyscrapers uh, by modern standards. It's not a very tall building, but it was revolutionary for its time. And you could see the building material steel um, uh, making the, the skeleton, I guess, of the building as it reaches taller and taller into the sky. All right, Mr. Eskridge, you're up. Okay, so kind of piggybacking off of that, the skyscrapers, we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, so from 1870 to 1900, the U.S. population doubled um, in size, much of that due to immigration, which Mr. Umbier will talk about in, after this slide. Um, but the, op the urban population is where this population explosion really happened. And so the, the South, for the most part, just to kind of talk about it for a minute, the South is going to continue to main, ma remain mostly rural, although the South um, during this time period does start to industrialize a little bit, um, have some more manufacturing and the cities grow a little bit, 
But for the most part, this large city growth is happening along the East Coast, um, along the West Coast, in places like San Francisco, um, the Bay Area, not really so much in Southern California yet, but really in um, along the, the East Coast, and especially in um, places like Chicago, around the Great Lakes, um, New York, others. And so the cities are growing exponentially. So between 1887, as it says on the reading, and 1920, over 25 a million immigrants arrive in the U.S. And Mr. Vieira, again, we'll talk about immigration, but these cities are very um, densely populated with not only immigrants, but other um, Americans as well. And for the first time during this time, by 1920, um, the U.S. Census revealed that the majority of Americans are living in urban areas, okay? So um, I think if we could look, think back to Thomas Jefferson, he's probably gasping because he had this, this dream of this agrarian, you know, nation um, that, you know, the virtue is held within the agrarian population and probably Hamilton would be rejoicing as he sees the growth of cities. Um, but so skyscrapers, as Mr. Vieira said, um, allowed cities to grow up, okay? And so here in the Valley, we typically see cities are spreading horizontally where we have a lot of farmland, we have a lot of land and that's, we kind of spread um, horizontally. Whereas in these densely populated cities because of steel, because you can um, build a skyscraper um, very tall, because of other technological innovations like electricity, indoor plumbing, telephones, and all of these things encourage cities to grow vertically. And so cities can grow exponentially. They can house their population in um, massive skyscrapers um, that continue to grow larger and larger. We also see the invention of mass transit systems, um, which create these massive cities. So people can travel um, by electric rail throughout the cities. Um, going from space to space. We also start to see um, suburban areas start to develop outside of cities, which that's gonna be a little bit um, more so after World War II, but we do start to see suburban cities starting to um, come about outside of cities and these um, mass transit systems are allowed or facilitate, not allow, um, facilitate um, travel within the cities. Um, by far the most important factor drawing people to American cities was economics. And Mr. Beer, I think maybe hit on the we'll hit on these push and pull factors. Um, but as the, the reading notes, the cities are places, are hubs of jobs, 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 jobs. Okay, um, and jobs in various sectors. We start to see the development of like the white collar workers, um, people that are doing these these um, managerial jobs, and we'll talk more about that on the last slide. Um, and it talks about in the reading. But um, again, cities are hubs of commerce, hubs of of jobs. And so people gravitate towards them. All right, um, so I'll turn it back to Mr. Vieira to talk about immigration. Okay, thank you. So one of the things, we have these two charts. On the left-hand side, uh, people immigrating to the United States in 1880, and then on the right-hand side, people immigrating to the United States in 1910. And there is a significant shift in what we refer to um, in history circles of us nerds as old immigrants and new immigrants. Uh, old immigrants prior to about 1900 is usually the cutoff date were overwhelmingly from Northwestern Europe. Uh, English speaking Protestant, meaning non Catholic uh, immigrants coming to America. Uh, we start to see that change and that shift around 1900 to immigrants who were more from the southern and eastern regions of Europe. Okay, uh, as you can see in 1910, three quarters of all immigrants coming to the United States were from um, regions of, of Europe which were non-English speaking and overwhelmingly Catholic and uh, to a lesser degree, but still important, uh, Jewish. You also see another shift in this chart uh, for the rest of the world. So one quarter of immigrants in 1880 were coming from the rest of the world. That huge chunk of that, if we could break it down, and we probably should have, and I apologize, was from China. And then in 1910, a, there's a significantly smaller piece of that pie. That's due to the Chinese Exclusion Act, which I believe we talk about in a later chapter. But in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act pretty much outlaws Chinese immigration to the United States. So sticking with this uh, theme of immigration and migration, uh, let's talk about immigration in America during this, this Gilded Age time period. Mr. Eskridge just said jobs. Economics is the number one reason people come to the United States of America. It's not the only one. Um, religious freedom, political freedom are also pull factors that draw Amer people to the United States. 
but jobs is the number one reason, especially during the Gilded Age. Um, and as people come from different parts of the world, uh, during the time period we're studying right now, overwhelmingly uh, Italy, they settle in what we call ethnic neighborhoods. Now, ethnic neighborhoods are parts of town in which immigrants can find a familiar language, a familiar culture or customs. Uh, in, likelihood, people, in, in all likelihood, people coming to the New World, coming to America, they're going to settle with family members. They're going to settle with um, friends and connections that they had or had made in the old country. Um, and so by 1890, 87% uh, of the population of Chicago was, I don't know if ethnic is the right word there, we probably should, I don't know if that's the right word, but we're, we're non-white, okay? We're immigrants from Ireland, we're immigrants from Italy. Uh, and so a huge portion of the population of America's cities were new immigrants who were having just come to the United States or were one generation removed from immigration to the United States. Many immigrants coming to America during this time period uh, were referred to as what we call birds of passage. And those are people who come to America for a job in all likelihood, try to acquire some wealth, send some of that money home, or after short periods of time, return back to their nation of origin. Whether it's Eastern Europe, um, if we're talking about the Russian Empire at this time, or Italy itself. Uh, and so that was common during this time period. But far larger numbers stay and add to the culture and kind of the fabric of America. In ethnic neighborhoods, immigrants can find many things that were familiar. Newspapers and native languages, native foods. I know that myself and Mr. Eskridge, we both enjoy a nice meal. And if you are traveling in cities, by far the best food to find is in the remnants of those ethnic neighborhoods. If you want really good Chinese food, Chinatown in San Francisco is awesome. Um, Little Italy. You can find outstanding food because it's ingrained in the culture of those neighborhoods. Uh, we see the remnants of ethnic neighborhoods that still exist in American cities, uh, still even in, 2020, in the 2020s. You also see religious buildings, churches, synagogues start to are being built in these ethnic neighborhoods in um, cities such as Boston, New York, Chicago, uh, and then of course, San Francisco. So Mr. Eskridge, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and he's gonna talk more about uh, America's urban centers. Okay, so um, kind of accompanying the immigration and um, immigrants that are living in these cities and the exponential growth of cities, there was also a fair amount of corruption um, that took place in cities. And um, this corruption was kind of orchestrated to be almost like a mutual aid society or like a mutual benefit, if you will. Um, so on the one hand, we had the political figures like the um, Tammany Hall we use as an example, but there were political machines as they're called um, in other regions or other cities around the US. Um, so they received the votes and therefore they maintained their political office. Certainly there was corruption, I'll talk about that. Um, and the ways that they were able to use that political office to their personal advantage. Um, but then on the other hand, immigrant populations also, you know, may have received a job, may have received, um, you know, assistance with um, housing, um, schools, different things like that. So many Americans found these new immigrant populations um, as an opportunity to, to kind of take advantage of people in order to kind of get what they wanted um, from, from these individuals. And so Tammany Hall, as we talked about, was a political machine in New York City. Um, it's New York City's Democratic, um, like, house, or not house, but Democratic club, if you will. And Tammany, um, I was just reading about it, um, is, was a fraternal order that came about after the revolution. Um, and so many cities across the, across the country had these fraternal orders where people would um, be members and, you know, a lot of the political elite, the economic elite, was, were connected to these um, fraternal orders. And so under Tammany Hall, um, probably most famously, Boss Tweed was the leader of Tammany Hall. Um, there's a, a political cartoon of him on the next slide that we'll talk about. Um, but they used bribery, they used faked elections to cheat um, the city out of millions. And so, for example, um, the, the reading talks about Plunkett of Tammany Hall, and he talks about this, this idea between honest graft and dishonest graft. And one of the examples, it's not in the, the reading, um, but basically for like um, a city park, let's say. So he gets word 
as an elected official that they're going to build a city park in a certain area of town. He goes then and buys up all the vacant land in the in the city or around where that park's going to be constructed, buys it up, then he owns it. Then when the city goes to purchase the land to build a park, hey, you know, he's the one that's going to sell it. And so he drives up the price. Um, and so he says, is that really dishonest? You know, he was taking advantage of this foreknowledge. He made legitimate business deals, paid the people that owned the land before fairly, and then turned it around and sold it to the city who, you know, was willing to pay those prices. So um, corruption, yes. All bad, eh, maybe not, okay? Um, and so despite this corruption, many New Yorkers enjoyed many of the projects that the political machines created. Um, if you go to New York now, you can enjoy some of these things as well. So you can travel across the Brooklyn Bay Bridge, not Brooklyn Bay Bridge, that's the Bay Area, um, the Brooklyn Bridge, sorry, um, Central Park Museums, um, many other places as it talks about um, in the reading roads, parks, bridges, um, hospitals, water, sewer, gas lines, schools, civic buildings, museums, all these places, um, police, fire departments, all had some connection in some way to um, the corruption of Tammany Hall. And this you know, happened in other cities as well. And so corruption, um, although it's you know, kind of a blight in the American story, it you know, did provide some um, things that we do enjoy and that were enjoyed at this time. Uh, anything else? Oh, and there, there were numerous people that were trying to expose these, this political corruption. You know, it's not to say that everyone was on board with this. There were you know, people that did not want this to be part of the American story. Um, part of American life. And so there were individuals that spoke out against it, such as Thomas Nast. And during this time period, um, Nast gives us a lot of really awesome political cartoons. So we'll become much more familiar with him um, in the, during this unit. Um, so on the next slide, you can see um, there is, um, yeah, uh, Boss Tweed, sorry. Uh, Boss Tweed, there he is, okay. Um, kind of controlling the ballot, um, represented there in his as a fat man, so he's gluttonous, if you will. Okay, uh, I think that's about it. So, Mr. Vier, I'm going to take it back. So All right, the New South. Thank you, good sir. Um, so, we're going to talk about the New South, the post-reconstruction, quote unquote, New South, and the racism that was rampant throughout that part of the nation. So, it is important as we begin, economically and socially, the New South is similar to the old. Um, sharecropping takes root as the, the main agricultural system of the time. And then once Reconstruction ends uh, after 1877, socially and politically, the New South will revert back to the old antebellum South, uh, which firmly installs white supremacy in the, the Southern social and political structure for generations. Emancipation does unsettle that social order and Southern whites uh, who are resistant to that change fight back. The face of that is the Ku Klux Klan. The KKK in the American South is responsible for organized state-sponsored terror against Southern African-American citizens. Murder was common. Um, the Ku Klux Klan's primary goal was to maintain white supremacy. And one of the ways in which they tried to achieve that was by restricting uh, the access to voting. And so voter intimidation was very common by the Ku Klux Klan, uh, trying to main, make sure that the only people who were voting were white men who were sympathetic to the Ku Klux Klan's cause and the old Confederacy's cause. Uh, as soon as we begin to see old Confederates um, voted into local elected positions, whether it is at the county level or at the state level, Jim Crow takes root in the South. Jim Crow laws were segregation laws that were passed in every single state. And the goal of Jim Crow was to separate the races, but again, it was to ensure white supremacy in Southern states. It was, some Jim Crow laws as examples, and uh, I believe in unit six, or seven, we talk more in depth about Jim Crow and the attempts to overturn Jim Crow laws, but separate schools, uh, laws banning interracial marriages, separate drinking fountains, uh, all these really ugly parts of America's history with the goal, again, to separate the races, but to make sure that one race of citizens, African-Americans, were viewed under law and uh, 
in society as a second-class citizen. And so the Redeemers were uh, was referred to as uh, Southern whites who their goal was to um, instill the Old South, okay, redeem the Old South. Uh, and they tried to achieve that by uh, instituting Jim Crow throughout all aspects of society. White mobs murdered roughly 5,000 African Americans between 1880 to 1950. You could find numbers which are far larger than that. Um, we put 5,000 here because that's what your textbook says. Lynchings were common and were often public events. Uh, the lynching of African American citizens was ceremonial in a lot of cases. Uh, the textbook references um, that trains would run to a certain town specifically for uh, white mobs to witness a lynching. And so it was a public thing, and it was something that happened in broad daylight. Uh, and really kind of the ugliest part of the, uh, probably, I mean, in my personal opinion, the ugliest side of America's history is really what happens um, after the Civil War. The Lost Cause glorified the Confederacy, and it really romanticizes the Old South. What the Lost Cause was, was changing the way that uh, the Civil, changing the reasons for the Civil War being fought, changing what slavery ultimately looked like. And can Old Confederate sympathizers tried to achieve that through literature, um, through the building of monuments glorifying the Confederacy. Uh, I mean, we see that in American history today in, in modern times where a lot of the old Confederate monuments are being um, taken down or, or destroyed. Those were built during this kind of time period from about 1880 to 1920 in which the goal was to uh, change the reasons that people believed the Civil War was fought and try and make it look like the South was fighting a noble cause and not one that was open rebellion. The New South would make technology and economic advances. Mr. Eskridge referenced how um, railroads started to be constructed more in the South than they had been during the pre-Civil War time. But again, politics and social customs were very similar to the antebellum South, and there was not a lot of progress made in that regard. Uh, and one of the images from your textbook, again, uh, a public lynching in broad daylight, African-American citizens murdered um, while dozens of people witnessed it and really did nothing to uh, help their fellow man. So Mr. Eskridge, go ahead. He's going to touch on the social conscience of the industrial age. Okay, so as we've talked about um, last week when we talked about um, capital and labor, there are many disputes between um, kind of the haves and the have-nots in American society. Those that were experiencing, you know, um, kind of unfathomable amounts of wealth and those that were living in um, destitute poverty. And so that poverty, um, that situation, that huge income inequality did not go unnoticed. And so there were many individuals during this time period um, around the turn of the century that started to look at these situations and try to deal with them. Some of them, um, such as the political machines, um, the bosses looked after immigrants in return to vote. So maybe there was some corruption there, but there were um, people that were starting, you know, looking out for the immigrants um, in various ways. And so the federal government really did nothing to aid these newly arrived immigrants. Um, and low, many of these immigrants are low skilled workers. And so they're kind of just left almost to their own um, devices essentially to you know figure out how to realize this American dream that they had heard about. And so kind of imagine, you know, if you're an immigrant, you're coming, maybe you're you know an individual and you come and you get off the boat and you heard about opportunities in America that are better than where you had come from and you really have nothing. And so you're probably gonna to try to look for, you know, a community, an immigrant community that you could bond with, um, or you know, someone that's gonna reach out to you and provide something, um, some assistance for you. And so you're gonna be loyal to them. And some of those were those political machines, but there were also, also other um, opportunities as well, um, such as the settlement houses as promoted by Jane Addams and other women that um, were really um, prominent and proactive in dealing with some of these, um, not just, and helping immigrants, but also dealing with some of these social ills that were associated with um, this time period and with um, this really second um, industrial revolution. And so there started to be um, these settlement houses which sought to help immigrants out, um, offered counseling, childcare, cultural activities, um, tried to empower, um, especially immigrant women with skills and opportunities so that they could 
you know, um, get a job that's maybe better than one they could find just right off of the, the, the ship, if you will, um, working in a factory for, you know, an unskilled job in these harsh conditions. And so they tried to um, provide more skilled opportunities for, for women and children as well. Um, there was also this idea, and we talked about the kind of um, the gospel of wealth a little bit last week when we looked at um, Andrew Carnegie and just this idea of like social Darwinism, that it was the, um, the rich and the powerful were, give, or they kind of achieved those positions because they were superior to um, you know, the, the poorer populations. And there were people that pushed back against that and said, no, you know, we have a duty to care for all of mankind. And much of this um, social um, consciousness was based in the religious or the Christian community um, who promoted this social gospel, that it's the, the role of the church, it's the role of um, Christians to look out for individuals in society. And so we see a lot of these, not just settlement houses, but other kind of um, groups that are looking to help people out. We also, as it talks about in the, the, the reading, there were a lot of like um, philanthrop, philanth I don't know, um, organizations. Philanthropic. Uh, thank you, thank you, philanthropic, um, that were funded by um, Rockefeller Carnegie that did seek to help out um, the, the poor and um, the working class. And so there's a lot of you know, ways that the immigrant population, the poor working class um, is um, kind of trying to be taken care of, if you will. Um, and you will see a lot more of that and these kind of ideas um, continue to grow and expand as we look into the progressive era, as we move into the early 20th century. So um, I think that's about all that we have, right, Mr. B? Yep, there's um, an there image of Jane of, Adams, yep. Yeah, um, so there is an image of Jane Adams there um, in the whole house, which is in Chicago and you know, providing education for young children. And so, yeah, do good things, they did good things. <laughs>